Chapter 3 Standing Stone Beach When Aiden came to, he was upon a rocky beach. He was sprawled out upon his back. Gulls circled him from high above. He laid upon the sand in shock, watching the carrion eaters drifting closer and closer to him. Both Calder and Christopher was lost to him within the void, and he was alone without anyone in a strange world. The gulls squawking grew louder, and the amount of them increased. He blinked away tears that was growing in his ducks. The seagulls lazily circled him from above, and he could hear them. Meat, they cried, one after the other, as if chanting. Aiden ignored the gulls, looking past them towards the blue sky above, watching the clouds. These clouds weren't dark, they were white, and they lazily floated by. The sun was just above him, its heat bearing down on him. Aiden didn't mind it, nor did he mind the gulls coming to feast upon him. I'm alone in a strange world, thought Aiden, tired and feeling defeated. One of the gulls landed to his side. Aiden watched it clumsily land as it kicked pebbles toward him. It shouted, Meat! Those above answered with their chant. This seagull that wobbled nearer to him seemed larger than the gulls he saw back on Earth. It was similar in color, but had a head like a vulture and a beak that looked like a drill bit. A second gull had landed upon a large stone nearby. That was when Aiden noticed there was a standing stone lodged into the rocky sand. I'm in a strange world. He pulled himself up, swatting away the gull who was within pecking distance. It called out in fright, taking up to the sky. The others mimicking and following its lead. They flew off in search of food that would put up less of a fight. Aiden crawled toward the nearest stone, placed his back against it, and pulled his legs closer in a sitting position. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath, calming himself. The breeze was cool, salty, and fresh, unlike the air he was used to back on Earth. With his back against the stone, he now faced the sea. Waves rolled upon the rocky beach. It didn't leave behind any trash either. The sun above it reflected upon its surface. There were smaller suns, like a sea of a thousand suns reflecting in the water. There was a light mist that would have been burned away about this time upon Earth. What was even stranger was that it was a purple mist. I'm in a strange world for sure, but I know this world, thought Aiden. Aiden's class was in physical education when he had injured himself by falling down the bleachers. The kids were not required to be active that day because of the storm that seemed to appear out of nowhere in the gulf. The coaches sat in stole-folded chairs near the entrance of the dressing rooms, whispering about that very storm. At first, two of the three coaches were talking very loudly about the coming storm. Miss Thompson, who also taught various science classes at the school, she thought she was vast intellectually superior to her two colleagues, and she carried herself proudly and have been caught boasting of it. Miss Thompson had quieted the two coaches by telling them it's probably best to talk about this topic in an inside level of voice. We don't want to scare the children. While the educators sat with their heads close together, they continued discussing the same topic as the children. Will the buses run early? asked one of the children. Jared Horton's dad already came and took him home, said a blonde girl, tossing her blonde hair to the side, chewing on gum. Normally, gum was an illegal contraband at the school, but no one seemed to care today. Most of the populace had a single thought running through their mind, the storm brewing in the gulf. Aiden sat at the upper corner of the bleachers. Usually, when weather permitted, the class would be held upon the school's football field. Aiden sat alone, reading T.H. White's The Once and Future King. It was a book that Aiden thought that 
could have inspired his dad's story of Enola, especially the parts about the king's and queen's exploits and scandals. He was deep into the book when he was interrupted by a voice. Do you mind if we join you? A young male voice. He doesn't mind at all, said a female voice, sliding in next to him. She lightly bumped into his shoulder, almost losing his place in his book. What if he doesn't want company, Willow? Aiden is sitting alone reading. I know I'd want a place to read without being bothered. The kid who the voice belonged to began to make his way away down the bleachers. Willow had dark brown hair and a face covered with freckles. She nudged Aiden with a small push and smiled. I'll have to get over it, right, Aiden? Aiden shrugged. He really didn't mind having company. Willow grabbed a hold of her companion and shoved him down before he could depart. He was stocky and round all around. He struggled to remove his mesh backpack. The three of them sat in awkward silence before it was broke by Willow. Ask him the thing, Oscar. Oscar fiddled with one of the straps of his backpack. So, was the High King's magic rise and fall? Was that an Enola tale? Aiden, holding his weathered copy of his book, looked from Oscar to Willow, considering the question. Yes, that story took place in Enola. I did leave some parts out because it's pretty scary. He stopped himself from going any further. Why? Aiden asked, suspicious of their curiosity. Aiden had been bullied the first time he had told his tales of Enola, his father's tales, but Aiden always left that part out even though it did feel wrong in doing so. To be honest, answered Willow, I loved it. Magic is my favorite. I've been waiting for an owl to show up with my letter, but it still hasn't happened. She screwed up her face and shrugged. Us nerds love that kind of thing. It reminded me of an RPG that I play, continued Oscar. Aiden marked his place with a bookmark he had made. He had drew a sword wrapped by a red silk the sigil of the Veil Knights. He had even attempted at giving the bookmarks some life by adding color. Unfortunately, Aiden did not have a knack for that particular form of art. So, you actually liked my story, Vinola. I could talk about fantasy places just like it all day. Hell yeah, so could we, Oscar said excitedly, almost too loud, drawing some attention to them. All three of them snickered under breath giggling at the use of the curse word. Once they got their laughter under control, they continued to talk about fantasy worlds from various fictions they enjoyed. Worlds from books, televisions, and video games. What I like about them the most is that even though there is always evil in these stories, most of the time, more than not, good always wins, said Oscar. If only Earth could be like our books, said Willow, leaning onto her knees. In an attempt to change the subject, Willow asked, Aiden, why is the mist in Enola purple? Considering the question before answering, thinking back to all the stories his father told, there was never an explanation for the purple mist or why it was always present. I honestly don't know. He never got to finish answering the question. What do we got here? asked a familiar voice. The beginning of a joke. To me, answered a second voice. The cruel voice belonged to a tall, muscular kid named Cory. He wore a black band tee with a reaper printed upon it. The second voice belonged to a thin kid wearing a polo tee named Derek. His hair was long and greasy. He had a large pimple upon his nose that looked red and irritated. He was already the victim of hormones starting to rage through his body. Derek had been held back from progressing with his fellow students. These two villains did not belong with Aiden's class. Corey and Derek stood over the three of them. Oscar's back was toward them, looking backward, neck turned awkwardly. A cow stood upon a barn. Derek reached down, grabbing Oscar by his pudge and pulling backwards. A cow who wanted to fly. Aiden watched as Oscar's eyes widened in horror and flailed his arms around madly, grabbing for something to hold on to. Oscar fell between two of the bleacher seats. Oscar made a U-shape, his head one tip of the letter, his feet the other tip. 
Aiden, with Willow's help, pulled Oscar up out of the bleachers, while Corey and Derek was busy with their cruel laughter. The three teachers looked up at the sound of them laughing, just as Oscar had found his seat. The children's tormentors acted innocent of any sort of misbehavior. Aiden noticed that other students at the school were starting to dwindle into the gym, so that's how these two had found their way here. Corey grabbed a hold of Oscar's sides, laughing. Let's see if I can make this hunk of meat roll further than Derek was able to. That was when Aiden saw red and threw himself at the villain that was Corey. After that darkness, as Aiden came to, there was a purple haze. This strange world was Enola. The purple mist of Enola, same as the stories Christopher had told Aiden so many times. Christopher's stories weren't pulled from his mind. It was real. And somehow his father had found his way over to this world. I spent enough time moping around, Aiden told himself, pulling himself up with the assistance from the stone. At last standing, sadness became anger. Aiden punched the stone, cracking his knuckles wide open, leaving a stain of blood on its surface. He held his hand, clutching it close, cursing his stupidity. Then he noticed while looking at the blood that the stone it was unusual. The gray of the stone was broke up by turquoise veins. With his uninjured hand, he ran his hand along the warm surface, inspecting it further. The blood was absorbed into the veins of the stone. He turned from the mysterious standing stone to discover that the beach was littered with these weird stones. Weird. I don't remember this in father's stories. After considering the standing stones, Aiden turned his attention to the beach that seemed to stretch for miles in both directions. The drill-beaked gulls were now further out over the rolling waves, still searching for their meal. Aiden picked a direction, hoping to find help, and began to walk the opposite of the soon-to-be-setting sun. Aiden did not want to be those gulls' next meal. He walked in the rocky sand, following a shadow being produced from the setting sun from behind for what seemed like hours. His neck felt like it was on fire, his ears burned, and legs began to weaken from the sun's heat. The sun took its time setting, causing Aiden to become fatigued by it, and to cause him to have a small sunburn. Though, as it set, the temperature began to fade, and the tide began to quickly rush up, higher than he thought it would. It drenched his socks and shoes. He walked through sea foam. Aiden pushed through his aches, pains, and tiredness. Aiden stopped only once to catch his breath. He hid beneath the shade of one of the stones lodged in the sand. He stretched out his legs reaching to his toes, trying to work out the aches he felt. Then he heard a blood-curdling screech from just ahead of him. Aiden ducked low, hugging the stone's corner for cover. He slowly peeked around the stone. There before him was a large crab the size of a horse. In its smaller claws was a large seal-like creature that squealed and struggled in its claws. He watched in horror as the crab brought its large claw to the seal's neck, clasped its neck. It closed its claws with a loud clack. The seal's head was severed from its body. He slowly hid behind the stone where he slumped to the ground. Aiden waited behind the stone, listening to the slurping and cracking of the crab feeding. He stayed there until the crab moved on. When he left from his hiding spot, he tried not to look at the bloody carcass of the seal. As hard as he tried not to look, he glanced at what was left. The crab had cleaned most of the meat from the bones, revealing its rib cage. Its head, he noticed, wasn't cleanly cut. It looked as if it was crushed from the rest of its body. It was a fate he did not wish to meet. 
and if he did encounter another of those large crustaceans, what else could he do other than run? So, traveling the length of the beach, he was much more jumpy and alert than he was before. His eyes darted about in search of danger. But he did not cross paths with any more creatures upon the beach. The only wildlife was the gulls that had reappeared, following him from above. Now there was less of them. Most had remained behind, feasting upon the remains of the seal's carcass. Just as the sun began to disappear, the land began to change. Before him was the bend of a river that spilled out into the ocean. There was long, vibrant floral growing at the banks of the river. The landscape of the opposite bank of the river was a coastal plain that seemed to stretch off into the twilight of the setting sun. Aiden could make out the speck of a mountain range in the distance. It was here, on this river bank, that Aiden collapsed out of exhaustion. He then dreamed. Aiden was standing upon a cobblestone path. All about him was silhouettes of buildings. Then there was a girl that appeared before him with curly hair and two tightly braided strands of hair hanging next to her ears. Bright yellow flowers surrounded the length of her head. She said something to him, but no sound came from her mouth. Pretty braids, said Aiden. She giggled like a girl in a schoolyard. He could actually hear her laughter. That is not my name, she said, but you can call me Purdy Braids if you wish. He did not wake till the sky was filled with stars and to the songs of the many sorts of wildlife that inhabited the area. Aiden could hear all the wildlife all their voices talking at once, over each other. They made no sense whatsoever. Large groups of animals had a tendency to overwhelm his mind, like when a group of people are excitedly trying to tell a story at once. This was exactly what was happening. Each form of life were telling its story or of some sort of experience that had occurred. There was the beginning of a headache at his temples, Aiden tried to push them out. These headaches were a reminder that, no matter what he told himself, that what he was hearing was not his imagination. They droned on. Were rubbing his temples, he watched the night sky and the reflection of the sky upon the current of the steady moving river. The reflection of the stars and the moon danced upon its surface. It was this that he focused upon to push out the thoughts, and it was just when the voices were stifled that he heard the voices belonging to a man and a woman. The voices were carried across the slow-moving river by a cool wind being blown from the north, a wind from the top of the mountain range in the distance, and across the coastal valley, bringing with it a variety of alien smells. It wasn't the assaulting smell of pollution, but pleasant smells of a healthy world. We may camp here, said the man's voice, across from the river. Aiden still sprawled upon the ground, lifted up his head, listening in the direction of the voices. Can we not push onward and camp upon the standing stone beaches? It would be a sight to see the twin moons upon the waters tonight. It was then that he noticed that there was indeed two moons, both crescent, barely a sliver of moons, one barely even vi visible. He had completely missed that small detail. Aiden, he pushed himself off the ground, squinting, trying to pinpoint where exactly these people were. Would they be friend or foe? Should he hide or make his presence known? Aiden remained as low as possible and crept along the bank, trying to stay behind the tall plant life that grew near the water's edge. He found their camp easily, their campfire a beacon for him to follow. Still concealed, he listened. Standing Stone Beaches is a dangerous area 
when the tide is coming. One night the tide may reach one point, the next it will be even higher, and not to mention the wildlife that call the Standing Stone Beaches home. They are very territorial, and best avoided. We make camp here, and not another word of the matter. Aiden slowly parted the brush to the side to see who the voices actually belonged to. He saw two figures. The male was in tall, impressive figure, the light of the camp making his shadow dance. He could tell he wore a long robe and held what looked like a walking stick before him. The female was small. She stood in a defensive manner. With one hand she spoke while waving it about, and the other hand she held a staff. Her shadows also danced upon the ground. From behind he heard clinking and heavy footsteps. Aiden spun around to be knocked in the face. His knees buckled beneath him.